I say good evening or kind of late and good afternoon, but uh, on behalf of the Institute for Public Policy and Professional Practice, one of the university's three research institutes which sponsor the annual Festival of Ideas, I'm John Diamond. I'm really pleased to welcome you this evening. Um, I spent part of the afternoon listening to Roger and John talk about higher education policy making. Um, I was going to say it felt like 30 years, but actually it was only about an hour, but it covered <laughs> 30 years. We talked about 30 years. <coughs> yes. Um, and one of the things that, that Roger asked me not to do was to give a long introduction, so that's good. Um, you'll be delighted by that. Um, <coughs> there's just two things I, I wanted to say at the start. Um, the Festival of Ideas this year's theme has been Equalities, and it's been interpreted in a whole vast range of different ways, from public lectures like this, to art events, to films, to workshops, in which the three institutes uh, covering health, creative enterprise, and I4P have contributed in different ways with colleagues from within the university and from outside. It seems fitting uh, on the final evening of the festival um, to reflect upon the future of higher education and to think in terms of what it has to say about equality or inequality. And Roger's topic, the theme of his topic, the marketization <coughs> of education, seemed particularly apposite. Um, if that seems fairly heavy for a Thursday afternoon, um, we talked about jokes, they'll all be entertaining. Um, but there's a serious point, which is those of us who work in higher education, those of us who spend our time thinking about the policy imperatives behind higher education, its role to play in society at a local, national, and global level, I think we'll have a lot to learn and to think about from Roger's talk this evening. So, on behalf of the university, on behalf of the Festival Ideas, Professor Roger. John, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm very, very pleased to be here this evening. Um, I'd just like to offer one or two sets of thanks. I'd like to thank the university for inviting me to come. I'd like to thank John and John and Danny Harkness who made the arrangements and the, uh, and the flyer, which is very good. Now, there is a handout um, which contains in particular some quotes, and that's because I don't do PowerPoint. <coughs> like many men, I can only do one thing at once. and. Uh, I prefer just to work from a sort of text, really. But anyway, you do have a piece of paper, and if it gets really boring, you can doodle on that bit of paper. <laughs> um, and the other thing is, I do apologise. Uh, I shall be talking about some quite complex matters. Some of you may think that I'm oversimplifying them, but then I have spent quite a lot of time with vice-chancellors. <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right. Um, so, um, I'm sure that you'll all be aware of the fact that there has recently been uh, what, in my view, are unprecedented levels of public criticism of universities. So we've heard about levels of student debt, tuition fees, dare I mention it, vice-chancellor's salaries and expenses, grade inflation, uh, no uh, safe space platforms and all the rest of it. And I think there's more probably public and media interest in higher education than there has been for many, many years. And my argument essentially this evening is that these public concerns and other concerns that I shall mention are not an accident. Uh, they are the inevitable consequence of the policies of marketization and privatization that successive governments have applied in relation to higher education, of which we, and particularly you, are now reaping the benefits, as it were. So my argument is in three parts. Uh, first of all, marketization <coughs> is what links neoliberalism, I shall define it in a moment, and higher education. So marketization is how neoliberalism reshapes higher education <coughs> as it does almost every other social activity. Therefore, the effect of marketization on higher education <coughs> is exactly the same, or broadly the same, as that of neoliberalism on society generally. It weakens collective values and it increases inequality by emphasizing what has been called possessive individualism. Uh, it's done in the name of making society healthier and, and more productive. Uh, 
but actually it's a synonym for the transfer of resources from people who are less well off of, to people <coughs> who are more well off. And this is also true within higher education, as I shall demonstrate. But thirdly, um, if we are to do anything about it, we have to embark upon a programme of resistance. And I don't so far see much, much sign of that. So, like Julius Caesar's Gaul, my lecture will be in three parts. First of all, I'm going to define what I mean by these terms I'm using. Secondly, I want to look at what the evidence suggests about their impact. And then I want to outline my agenda for resistance, as it were. And now, some of you will know, and many of you will have read, there is a substantial uh, literature on neoliberalism and higher education. So to be quite clear, what I'm talking about <coughs> are the neoliberal policies <coughs> towards higher education, uh, which have been going for many, many years, but particularly since 2012. As I'm sure you all know, we now have full cost fees for full-time undergraduates, what is effectively a voucher system for funding higher education of precisely the same <coughs> character that Milton Friedman, one of the great advocates of neoliberalism, argued for in 1962. We have no limit now on the numbers of undergraduate students that can be recruited. We have new and more extensive methods of quality assurance, notably the teaching excellence framework, and we have further easing uh, of the market entry rules for new providers. And given that even before 2012, we already had one of the most marketized systems of higher education <coughs> in the world, these are very uh, significant uh, developments. And although I should be talking primarily about student education, almost everything I have to say does apply also to academic staff research and scholarship. So let me start with some definitions, and you'll find a whole page of quotes, uh, ending, one f ending with one from the blessed Margaret Thatcher. Um, I'm not going to read them. Uh, I will read one later because it's my own quote, and I think I'm entitled to read that. Uh, but the rest you can read or not as you choose. I've tried to, to have some quotes here based upon my own now fairly extensive reading of neoliberalism to try to explain exactly what the beast is. And perhaps I can just pick out one phrase from there. Mrs Thatcher, 1981, economics are the method. The object is to change the heart and soul. Don't think that neoliberalism is about playing around with things. It's not. It's a serious attempt to, to change our society. Within <coughs> public policy, within higher education, I'm identifying five strands of neoliberal policy that are relevant, and again, they're on the handout. I won't, won't read them out, but basically deregulation, we're all familiar with that. Privatization, again, that's a fairly common term. Tax reduction, the idea that we should reduce taxes. Welfare programs being cut back and macroeconomic policy focusing upon the reduction of inflation rather than unemployment. This is all very familiar conventional stuff, and I think it wouldn't be uh, controversial. And so the austerity policies that have been visited on the country in varying degrees <coughs> since 2008 represent a continuation of that, of that view. So summarising it, the neoliberal view is that the individual, you and I, are essentially a piece of capital. As with other forms of capital, the aim is to develop and exploit it. And thirdly, the best way of doing that is through market competition, effectively competition between capitals. And what that means for higher education is that education is rendered as a consumer good in which students invest, incurring, as we know, considerable debt, to advance their prospects. And universities are essentially providers of such consumer goods and should be organised and run as if they were any other commercial provider. That's it. That's neoliberalism in a nutshell, as it were. Now, if you go into the history a bit, these policies were first adopted with disastrous results in Chile after the coup against President Allende in 1973. And they've been adopted by most Western governments to a greater or lesser extent in the period since. But they've been applied most extensively in the major Anglophone countries, particularly Britain, America, Australia. And as we all know, they're particularly associated with Ronald Reagan and, and Margaret Thatcher. <coughs> and they've been extended to many developing countries by international organisations like the IMF, the World Bank, the OECD, through something called the Washington Consensus. So that's my definition of neoliberalism. Please come back to me if, if you're not happy with it or 
uh, or if you want to modify it. Marketization, and again you'll find on the handout a quote uh, in the usual deathless prose of these documents uh, from uh, what was then called the Department of Business Innovation and Skills. I won't read out the whole thing, but maybe the key phrase is the government's view, competition between providers in any market incentivizes them to raise their game, offering consumers a greater choice of more innovative and better quality products and services at lower cost. Higher education is no exception. As a former Secretary of State of mine, Kenneth Baker, would have said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm using the <coughs> term marketization to refer to the process whereby the supply of a good or service, in this case higher education, is organised as if it were an economic market where supply and demand are balanced through the price mechanism. I'm distinguishing privatisation because that is about the, owner, the transfer of the ownership of the supply of goods and services. Many people would argue that higher education is actually a quasi-market because, for example, the government controls price, the prices don't necessarily relate very much to costs and so on. Um, and indeed, there is an academic term called quasi-markets which describes that situation. There are some people who uh, think that I'm exaggerating the effect of marketisation or the, or the extent to which higher education is a market. Um, but it was established many years ago by an American economist called Balmol um, that you don't need to have a full market in order to have market-like behaviour. And I, particularly those of you who've been in higher education for any <coughs> period of time, will be able to remember that universities began operating in a commercial way many, many years ago, as it were. So that's really all I want to say about marketization. But just in order to fill out the history, in the book that I wrote, published in 2013, I actually identified a whole series of, of decisions and policies over the years before 2012 that have together created at least a quasi-market in higher education. Um, in fact, the first step historically was when the Thatcher government removed the subsidy for overseas students' fees. It, it's unbelievable now, but up until 1980, overseas students had their fees subsidised in much the same way, though not to the same extent that home students had their fees subsidised. That was removed. More significant, I think, was the introduction of the research assessment exercise, now the REF, which in effect created a quasi-market in research. Then in 1990, we had the introduction of loans for maintenance, which Mrs Thatcher was originally opposed to, but was talked around by Kenneth Baker and others. Then we had the beginning of the liberalisation of the rules for degree awarding powers and university title, with the abolition of the binary line in 1992. Then from 1998, we had tuition fees gradually being introduced. And then, of course, we had the bigger fees from 2006. And we now have fees, as I say, which cover the full costs of, of teaching. There have also been moves to corporatise university governance and to increase the number of performance indicators to which universities are subject. And finally, with the Office for Students, we now have a much more comprehensive <coughs> and powerful external regulator of higher education uh, with new and quite unprecedented controls over universities, including the ability to revoke degree awarding powers and university title. Now what underlies these policies is the government's view, and this has been true of Conservative and Labour governments, that the primary value of higher education is improving our economic performance, and that the most valuable outcomes of higher education are credentialed graduates and commercially uh, exploitable knowledge. So that universities have to be reconfigured as PLC, university campuses have to look like shopping malls, Vice-chancellors have to be called chief executives. Governing councils have to be more like company boards. Academic <coughs> departments have to be seen as revenue-generating units. Staff have to be assessed and rewarded by their contribution to the bottom line. And students have to be reimagined as adroit consumers and investors taking out loans now to increase their purchasing power later. And this, in order to be quite clear, reflects a neoliberal position that every social process exists to serve the economy and that as far as possible every organisation and individual should be restructured on the private corporate model. And I think that is pretty clear from, from, from what's been happening. So those are my definitions. Play with them, think about them and contest them as you, as you like. Let me now turn to the second part which is about the impact of these policies. Starting with neoliberalism. <coughs> 
well, I'm sorry to say if there are any supporters of neoliberalism in this room, that neoliberalism, even on its own criteria, has actually been a failure. One of the main arguments in favour of neoliberal policies from people like Reagan and Thatcher, economists like Hayek and Friedman, were that they would improve the performance of the economy because decisions would be taken through the market by people who had a proper knowledge of what we were doing rather than by a remote centralising state. But I have to say that on every conventional measure of economic performance, economic growth, employment, unemployment, investment, productivity, innovation, debt, the performance of the Western economies since the mid-70s, late 70s has been far inferior to what it was before that period, the period roughly from 1945 to the mid-70s. Um, only, on, only on inflation has the record been, been significantly better than it was previously. We've also seen a series of financial crises, most recently in 2008-9, which have caused great misery and deprivation and damage to public services. Uh, and we've also seen increased inequality, poverty and insecurity, and the evidence for that is set out in my book. There's also been a, a decline in levels of trust. And as people like the OECD and the IMF, who were previously cheerleaders for neoliberalism, now accept, the past 40 years or so has seen a massive transfer of income and wealth away from the lower and middle classes in the Western economies towards the top 1% the top of the population, and especially the top 0.1%, and that will probably continue. And in turn, these, these detriments to the social state have had economic consequences, and in particular, they've created what a Keynesian would call underconsumption, uh, whereby people simply haven't got, the wage earners haven't got the, the purchasing power any longer to keep the economy running at the level at which it ought to be, which is also reflected in the fall of the wage share in, in the national economy um, and uh, other similar consequences. And finally, and perhaps most seriously of all, this concentration of economic power is now replicated in the concentration of political power, what Noam Chomsky called the platonomy, an economy driven by the wealthy, is a clear threat to liberal democracy. And you can see that very, very clearly in America. So to summarise on the impact of neoliberalism, it's clearly imposed a series of economic, social and political costs on our Western societies without any significant compensating benefits. Instead of expanding these economies uh, so that the growth in productivity is, is, is shared by the, the entire population, what has actually happened is that the smaller increments of po productivity improvement have been appropriated by a tiny subset. So it's therefore hardly surprising that there is such widespread public anger at the elites who govern our countries and such strong popular support for radical anti-elite movements of almost every stripe. In my view, uh, both Brexit and Trump are the almost inevitable outcome of the neoliberal reforms begun by Mrs Thatcher and President Reagan and continued by their successors, and for which I believe we are now paying a heavy price. So how does this affect higher education? How does, where does this how does education stand in relation to all this? Well, in 2011, I edited a book based on case studies of the impact of marketization on nine developed higher education systems. I needn't list, list them, but anyway, they were representative uh, of the international pattern. And the overall conclusions were fairly, were fairly balanced. Marketization had certainly made universities more efficient, uh, more responsive to students and other stakeholders though it's arguable that those benefits could have been achieved through other means. And there is also, I think, an argument at least that universities are perhaps becoming too responsive to students and other key stakeholders like donors. It's also true that marketization may have increased the overall level of resources for universities, although that's rather harder to prove. However, we also found, and subsequent experience confirms, that there was also a large number of what, when I worked for the Office of Fair Trading, used to be called detriments. Nice word. Um, and in my book, and our book, and subsequently, we identified no, le no less than eight sets of detriments. They're listed on your, on your handout, one to eight. And what I propose to do now is just to go through them 
one by one um, so that you can see what, in my view, has been the impact of marketisation on our higher education system. Sorry, I must just uh, take a sip of water. So let me start with the first, which is um, our old friend, stratification. Uh, higher education institutions are almost always hierarchical, but marketisation reinforces that. And the basic reason is that unlike many consumer goods markets, there simply are no reliable metrics by which you can uh, assess and compare student education. So you want to buy a fridge, you go on the website, you look at what John Lewis has, you order it and that's it. If you, if you take which, you have which, that's fine. Higher education is not, not like that. For a start, we don't know what the, pro can anyone tell me what the product is? Um, how do you measure the product? Uh, how do you do it? In how, how can you know in advance what the product is going to be, et cetera, et cetera? Basically, in higher education, there are simply too many variables, including what the student themselves brings to the party. And of course, many of them can only be identified long after the students completed the course. Higher education is a post-experience good. I argued that at great length in a 2007 paper for the Higher Education Policy Institute. However, if you are going to organise the supply of something on a market basis, then there has to be some consumer information. There have to be some <coughs> performance metrics. Um, and in higher education, not surprisingly, what people turn to is institutional prestige, uh, how prestigious an institution actually is. And that, in turn, is usually associated with how long the institution's been, been existing, how selective it is in its recruitment, how well-resourced it is, and, particularly in our system, how good it is at research. But there are, in fact, huge resourcing differentials already between our institutions, uh, which the abolition of student number controls is actually exacerbating. And I just give you some figures. In 2015-16, and leaving aside Oxbridge, which is a totally different story, the multi-faculty university with the highest income from all sources per FTE student, which is Imperial College, had four and a half times the median university income per FTE student. The average is 13,360. And the university with the lowest income per FTE student, which I'm very glad to say is not Edge Hill University, <coughs> not any longer anyway, um, which is Bucks New, had only 70% of the median. Now these institutions are formally equal, but they're clearly not equal in resourcing terms. <coughs> and if you think that's bad enough, it gets worse with wealth. The 24 institutions in the expanded Russell Group own nearly 60% of the net assets of the, of the 161 inst institutions covered by the HESA statistics. So this is exactly what is happening in society generally, and it's very clearly happening in higher education. What marketisation, in fact, does is to reinforce the process where many institutions are engaged in a perpetual upwards push for status, whether or not that's actually in the interest of the institution those it serves, or the system as a whole, what has been called the higher education arms race. But because the quantum of prestige, by definition, cannot be increased, the inevitable outcome is an even greater reputational and economic distance between the most prestigious institutions and the rest. And that is what we see very clearly in English higher education, symbolised by the dominance of the Russell Group. And this is a classic winner-take-all market of the kind that already accompanies privatisation and deregulation in many other sectors. So, for example, only a few weeks ago, the Times carried a report where the senior vice principal of Royal Holloway College was complaining that some schools were refusing to allow non-Russell Group universities like them to send representatives to their open days. And, and I mean, just to give you another example, I have been chair until recently of a big sixth form college in, in just near Southampton. Um, and I talk a lot, I used to talk a lot to the students there, and the one thing that their parents know about, and this is not a particularly sophisticated part of the world, is the Russell Group. Um, someone really ought to write a PhD on the marketing success of the Russell, of the Russell Group. <coughs> However, <coughs> I'm not just talking about economic distance, I'm also talking about social distance. And we have, in higher education, as in the school system, 
um, a very clear system where the more prestigious universities mostly recruit students from better off families, while the bulk of students from disadvantaged backgrounds go to less favoured institutions. As the Vice-Chancellor of London Met pointed out recently, only 62 of our 132 universities enrol a fair proportion of students from disadvantaged backgrounds, but the remaining 70 students from the most advantaged areas are still twice as likely to gain a university place as their peers in disadvantaged areas, and the ratio increases to 9 to 1 at 10 of our most selective institutions. And another recent analysis shows that according to the most frequently used measure of economic inequality, something called the Gini coefficient, a number of British universities, nearly all from the Brussels group, have a higher degree of social selectivity than the UK as a whole and most developed countries. So th 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 this, this myth that, that there is some kind of levelling taking place is just a myth as regards to the social intake, uh, and even as it's a myth as regards to the economic situation. So that's all I want to say about stratification. Let's now turn to institutional diversity. If you read almost any official document published on higher education over the last 30 years, there's bound to be an obligatory reference to the desirability <coughs> of institutional diversity, the idea that you have a range of institutions pursuing a, a range of missions, which in turn reflect a broader set of different student, employer and social needs. And it is uh, a chronic problem for higher education policymakers, and not only in market-based systems like ours, because there is also what has been called in the jargon a degree of isomorphism, with universities all wanting to be like one another, what has been called competition through emulation. And this is an inherent tendency within, within higher education. But marketization presents three challenges to the attempt to create a more diverse system. First of all, to have any meaningful diversity, there has to be some degree of parity of esteem between different university missions. But as we've just seen, marketization actually places greater distance between more and less prestigious institutions. As a result, what might be called horizontal differences, differences in mission and ethos, become vertical differences, differences in standing. Howard Newby uh, once said that the English have a genius for creating hierarchy out of diversity. Uh, secondly, marketization and the commercial league tables enshrine the notion of the large, highly selective, multi-faculty, research-intensive institution, what is sometimes called the multiversity, as the default model for the system, which means that other kinds of institution tend to occupy second or even third class class status. Many years ago, uh, when the league tables were first coming in, the Times League table was run by a man called Bernard Kingston, who'd previously run the Sheffield Careers Service. I knew him quite well. I was on a platform with him, and um, uh, we were talking about league tables, and I said, Bernard, can I ask you a question? And I expect an honest answer. Yes, he said. I said, can you tell me? I was then the principal of Southampton Institute. I said, can you tell me? Um, if you found a league table which showed that Southampton Institute was the top institution, would you publish it? He said, honestly, no, I wouldn't. Uh, so that, I think, tells its, tells its own story, really. Actually, there is, there is one league table where Southampton Institute or Solent was for a while. I haven't looked at it recently. But they were the t one of the top for in universities for online reviews. There were 20,000 at that time, there were 20,000 online reviews and some, some sad policy wonk had gone through them and reckoned that there was a higher proportion of positive views of the university than for anyone else. I, I give you that unvarnished, as it were. OK, and then the third problem is that if it goes on long enough, marketization produces a rationalisation of the system where each surviving provider offers broadly the same range of choices as institutions, subjects and modes that do not command market support simply disappear. That's already happened with most of the specialist institutions. When John and I first came into higher education, we worked for, many worked for specialist institutions, colleges of education, colleges of art, medical schools, etc. They're virtually all gone. There are virtually no major specialist institutions left. There may be one per sector, uh, but that's it. So you've got fewer specialist institutions. You've got fewer subjects because subjects that, that 
that can't support that can't be supported by the market have to disappear. We had a very good political science department when I came to Solon, and it ha we had to close it because the students were going to to old universities, etc. Never mind about the quality of what was there. Modes disappear. I mean, part-time higher education is largely is largely disappearing, um, and that's inevitable because the whole point about markets is to create winners and losers. And in higher education, the losers are the institutions that can't even now uh, make a suitable uh, profit and can't can't reinvest. Um, so, just as with the Brexit and a soft Irish border, market competition and genuine diversity are simply incompatible. You can either have one or the other, but you can't have both. Now, let me turn to innovation. Uh, it's a fundamental belief of neoliberalism that market competition fosters innovation by welcoming new suppliers into the market. Um, however, in higher education, what increased competition does is to make institutions play safe in case they fall foul of the regulators or even the media if what they offer is too far from the mainstream. This again is a function of the information problem. It's also a function of the hierarchy. The fact is that the most prestigious institutions not only don't innovate, but don't need to innovate. In fact, they compete by offering a traditional experience and competing on that. It's what one might call the Jacob Rees-Mogg approach to, uh, mm. to competition. Meanwhile, less prestigious institutions that might have more incentives to innovate uh, simply don't, do, don't get the rewards for doing so. Southampton Institute was the first uh, higher education institution to an offer, offer an online MBA. It was very innovative, it involved a lot of investment, it was very good, but it didn't, didn't fly because it was Southampton Institute. Government ministers often equate innovation with new higher education suppliers, but actually the evidence is that most new suppliers are simply offering the same as what the public providers offer, but more cheaply because their staff are not funded to do research. Moreover, they often do it on the back of a stream of public revenues, which in effect makes them public institutions. Um, in any case, if you really want to be serious about improving access for the kinds of students that the uh, private providers claim to be catering for, then you should change your policies towards the school system, but don't let me get into that. Internal differentiation, I simply mean by that, that what marketization does is to create an increased separation between activities that are already possibly quite separate but are even more so. Uh, activities, structures, personnel. The, the, most, the most classic example, the classic example probably, is where you distinguish activities that can generate external revenues from ones that can't. Um, and the separation of research from teaching in many institutions. There are more and more structures that are devoted to revenue generation uh, rather than other things, and there is a very, very clear increased differentiation of personnel, which doesn't do wonders for academic collegiality, as it were. The next one on my list, paradoxically, is risks to, risks to, risks to quality. If you had a minister here, you would be going on about how competition improves quality. Um, in fact, competition in higher education is actually detrimental to quality. The clearest example of that is grade inflation. It, it is beyond, uh, it is beyond uh, parody that the Office for Students has been asked to investigate grade inflation at a number of institutions. This is, of course, a direct result of the competitive regime that they have introduced. It's, it's quite understandable. If your position in the league table partly depends upon how many first and two ones you offer, naturally you offer more first and two ones. More seriously is the fact that by having more external regulation and also the pressure to generate external revenue, the control of the academic agenda, what is taught and researched, passes away from the academic community. And this is seen in many institutions in America. It's increasingly happening here. And the ability of self-regulation to protect the quality of what's offered is also, is also diminished. Um, and I mentioned grade inflation. One of the very clearest um, signs of neoliberalism working is increased cheating. Um, and there's a classic study covering not just higher education in America, showing how as a result of increased marketization, people in all sorts of parts of, of society are increasingly cheating. My next one is diversion of resources. Uh, many years ago, a writer called Andrew Wernick uh, 
coined the term the promotional university to describe how American universities were becoming increasingly uh, entrepreneurial, public relations oriented, engrossed in the search for funds. And it's, it's beyond argument, I think, that British universities are putting more and more effort into things like marketing and advertising and into attention-grabbing activities like high-quality residences, sports facilities, etc. Those are resources that should really be being used for teaching and research. And, of course, it's, it's, it's mostly wasted money because if insofar as it's de devised to, to gain greater prestige, um, it won't succeed because, by <coughs> definition, one institution can only go down, uh, can only go up if another goes down. When I was still a vice-chancellor, I would write from time to time to other vice-chancellors who were boasting or setting out as their aim to be a top 20 or a top 50 or a top 100. And my question always was, well, which institutions are going to make way for you? Surprise, surprise, I never got a proper response, as it were. <laughs> um, another characteristic of neoliberalism is instability and short-termism. Market theory assumes that suppliers and consumers will work fairly quickly to market signals. But as we know in higher education, the lead time in developing courses, the length of the courses, the need for proper evaluation, and not least the specialisation of the teaching staff and resources, it's actually very difficult for institutions to respond quickly to variations in, in demand. Um, higher education is essentially a long-term business, at least by contemporary standards. Increasing competition also increases instability, which is a particular problem for teaching intensive providers that are heavily dependent upon fees and don't have significant sources of other revenue, which is most of them. Most of them. Economically, institutions like my former institution are only as good as their last set of enrolments. This again relates to the uh, will willingness to, to incur risk, again completely contrary to the neoliberalism idea that entrepreneurialism and risk-taking kind of go together. In fact, the increase in short-termism in higher education mirrors the increase in short-termism in business, of which so many commenta commentators have complained, and which indeed reflects market reforms in those sectors. So that's a fairly formidable list of detriments, but there's one more which in a way trumps all the rest of them. And this is where I'm actually going to read out my own quote, because I haven't found a quote that I think is better than that. Sorry and all that. Uh, no false modesty. <laughs> the fact is that marketization poses a th very direct threat to the role that universities have played as a relatively independent source of information about and conscience and critic of society. I wrote an article about this in the Higher Education Review. By the way, for public record, the Higher Education Policy Institute refused to publish my article because it was too close to the bone for some of the vice chancellors on the advisory board. And I described the position thus. Higher education operates under a sort of contract with society, whereby universities have a certain degree of autonomy as well as certain financial privileges in return for carrying out their central function of, di of discovering, accrediting, disseminating and conserving knowledge. This implies that they will focus on these tasks and carry them out in a conscientious and reasonably efficient way. Yet the more they concern themselves with their position in the pecking order, as well as with what should be peripheral activities like marketing and fundraising, the more this contract or bargain is placed at risk, the more they will jeopardise their still considerable reservoir of public support and the harder it will be for them to command the resources they need to discharge their key functions. This will be society's loss as well as the universities. Well, I think those com that was 2014. Now, um, when, f when significant fees were first introduced, 2004 to 6, uh, the then chair of the Charities Commission, Dame Susie Leather, made a, quite a, a categoric public statement warning that if universities were to gain more revenue from private sources, which notionally fees are, um, it could put their charitable objectives at risk. There was a great hoo-ha about it, John may possibly remember it, um, but she never followed up on her threats. Um, now I, for the pur purpose of this lecture and one or two articles I'm writing based on it, um, I tried to contact Dame Susie Leather, who is now the chair of the board of the Independent Adjudicator on Student Complaints, and she wouldn't, she declined to be interviewed. So clearly that episode left scars with her. But I think it is the case 
if higher education institutions simply act as commercial companies, why should they have any particular, uh, particular privileges, as it were? Um, I don't want to sell too many kind of anecdotes, but um, th th to give you an idea of how, how far we've come, uh, some of you may recall that in the early 2000s, the, or from 97, the Labour government set up regional de development agencies. There would have been one for the North West. And basically, these were government agencies trying to broker partnerships between business, local communities, universities, etc. And they had a small sum of money with which to do it. And in the South East, where there are a lot of universities, the RDA for the South East had a glitzy event uh, for the vice chancellors of the universities, it was only vice chancellors allowed to attend, and we were in cafe style setting. And so, on each table, there were four or five or six vice chancellors and one representative of the regional development agency. And through the evening, between the courses, um, the RDA representative would would mention various projects that the RDA was 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 engaged in to excite the interest of the vice chancellors. And it didn't matter which vice chancellor responded, it could have been any of us, it certainly could have been me. Our response always was, well, that's very interesting, what's in it for my university? Now, the RDA representative on my table was a woman I'd worked with in the civil service uh, in the Department of the Environment, a woman called Pamela Ranks, Pam Alexander. Um, and when we got up to leave, um, uh, she beetled over to me and said, Roger, can, I, can we have a word? I said, yes, of course. She said, these vice chancellors of yours, I said, they're not my vice chancellors. <laughs> Actually, I have as little to do with them as I possibly can. Um, she said, these vice chancellors of yours, she said, they're far more, com far more entrepreneurial than the business people we meet. I said, Pam, where have you been for the last 20 years? The, f the one certain success of Mrs. Thatcher was to make the universities more like companies. And of course, the, the further development since then will make that worse. So let me just summarize this second part of the lecture and the impact of marketization. I think it's fairly clear from this account of recent developments in, UK higher, in English higher education that the impact of marketization on the provision of higher education mirrors that of neoliberalism on society generally, and for similar reasons. Marketization has sharpened the differences within the system, transferring resources and power to a small subset of more prestigious institutions at the expense of the great majority, and without any compensating benefits. So-called top universities are lionized by ministers and the media, while most of the rest are seen as also rands, and their contributions to the system, the economy and society correspondingly devalued. Moreover, so far from increasing diversity of provision, marketization encourages conformity and playing safe. Contrary to the government's claims, consumer choice of subject, course, mode and type of institution is actually reduced. Marketization is commodifying higher education, whilst weakening the ways in which the quality of what universities offer is protected. It's placing yet more obstacles in the path of wider participation and the health of the institutions that promote it, obstacles that have already been greatly magnified by the application of privatisation and consumer choice to the compulsory sector of education. Just going off at a tangent, if you haven't seen it, Fiona Miller, a good friend of mine, has just written a book uh, called The Best for My Child. It's an analysis of the effect of market policies in education over the past 20 years or so, and it makes very interesting and sobering, sobering reading. In higher education, money is being devoted to activities like marketing and branding that should be being used for student education and support. And finally, and I think most potentially seriously, marketization is taking higher education away from the exploration and dissemination of knowledge for its own sake towards a much narrower role as a handmaiden of the knowledge economy, as a producer of useful knowledge, and as a trainer of labor market ready graduates. That's my view. So what should we be doing about it? Well, we now come to the final and most difficult part of the lecture. And it's a pity I haven't got anything stronger, but perhaps I will, will <laughs> later. Because you, you need a strong drink after you've, heard, uh, after you've heard what I'm about to say. OK, so again, it starts with a couple of quotes. And again, I won't, uh, I won't go into it, except to say that if you want to look at the broader impact of neoliberalism on higher education, then Harry Giroux's work, and particularly the 2014 uh, book, is a good place to start. So what do we do? I think we have to do three things. And you may well ask me in question of who do I mean by the we. 
First of all, we have to expose the fallacies and inconsistencies of those who argue for neoliberalism and marketization. Secondly, we have to resist the continuing marketization of higher education. And thirdly, we have to work with other groups in civil society to restate the value of collective public goods as opposed to the possessive individualism that lies at the heart of neoliberalism. So let's tell those one by one, exposing the fallacies. I think a good starting point, rather like the Commission of Truth and Reconciliation in South Africa after apartheid, a good starting point would be to own up to our own role in complying with assisting and indeed promoting neoliberalism. And I have a quote from David Harvey's 2011 book to that effect. It's beyond dispute that, that neoliberal thinking was developed in the universities, and especially, but not only, in their economics departments, <coughs> some of which still, I'm afraid, are guilty um, of that. It's arguable how far that in itself was, clin was a clincher, as opposed to neoliberal theory providing a fig leaf for politicians like Reagan and Thatcher, who wanted to make changes anyway. But it's hard to deny the value of having a broad, convincing theory of theory of body of theory to explain, justify, and reconcile people to certain policies adopted. What is now needed, fairly obviously, is an alternative but equally compelling vision of society that offsets the emphasis on individual agency with a recognition of the benefits and possibilities of collective action and social solidarity. In the meantime, I think it's our duty to expose the falseness and incoherence of the claims made for the application of market theory to almost every sphere of human activity. Because we're talking this evening about higher education, but if you look at housing, health, almost any, any sphere of our society, it's dominated by neoliberal assumptions and precepts. I've, there is some hope, I think, um, given, uh, ironically given that it seemed to mark the vindication of market capitalism, the fall of communism in the West does provide quite a helpful precedent. One of the main reasons why communism collapsed was the increasing gap between the claims of the regime on the one hand and people's everyday experiences of it on the other. And we have a classic case this very day with what's happening on the railways, which I probably don't in this area don't need to expatiate on, but uh, a, what a clearer demonstration of the bankruptcy of current policies would be hard to imagine, unless it's Grenfell Tower, unless it's Brett, anyway, we won't go on. <laughs> so our first point has to be to expose the falseness of the claims <coughs> made for the application of market activity to almost every sphere of human activity. Fortunately, as I've already indicated, there's no shortage of material. Second strand, we have to resist <coughs> marketization. It is depressing how much, when higher education, we've already adopted the values, language, and practices of neoliberalism. Here is my resistance program. One, we refuse to have anything to do with the commercial league tables or with guides that use material from their rankings. Two, we explain the fundamental methodological problems and limitations of the institutional rankings, the National Student Survey, the key information set, the so-called longitudinal educational outcomes and other similar devices that purport to inform and guide student choices. At this point, I sometimes get a bucket and want to uh, uh, vomit into it when I refer to those, uh, those, those devices. Thirdly, we should, however, show how we use our resources to provide, to provide the best possible education for our students how our investment in research and scholarship supports that, as well as contributing to the stock of knowledge and improvement more generally. Fourthly, we should limit our expenditure on activities like marketing, advertising and branding. For many years, I've advocated sector-wide agreements which control such expenditure in relation to turnover. The fact that such an agreement will be regarded as anti-competitive by the authorities just shows how far up the creek they actually are. In a status market, you have to limit the consequences of status. I would now add two further things. First of all, avoiding modes of governance, management and resource allocation that merely ape the worst practices of the corporate sector, for example, Carillion, without even the thin justification for them there. Um, the fact that uh, David Eastwood uh, gets a salary for being a, 
member of the board of the University Superannuation Scheme, on top of the money he earns as a vice chancellor of Birmingham, for which anyway he's seriously overpaid, is actually a national political scandal. And I'm proud of the fact that I was the person who drew the Daily Mail's attention to it. <laughs> um, and secondly, we need to recall and reiterate what it is that binds us together as a sector. It cannot be an accident that before 1992, the existing universities belonged to one body and the politics to another. But now we have a proliferation of status-based organisations claiming to represent the sector, but actually competing with one another in an unhelpful way by emphasising what distinguishes their members when what is really important at the present time is what the universities collectively have in common. And all this is in addition to demonstrating clearly the costs and detriments of the continuing marketisation of higher education, as well as contesting the underlying view that higher education is primarily an economic rather than a social and cultural good. If you think I'm making this up, may I refer you to the comments of the Chair of the House of Commons Select Committee on Education, one Robert Halfen MP, who recently suggested and has reiterated that students who want to study subjects like history or English that don't have an immediate labour market outcome should actually pay higher fees than students who are studying what he calls vocational courses. I, I cannot, uh, I, I, even I am for, for find it hard to do justice to the idiocy of such a, such a statement. Um, so we have to do all that. We have to show why higher education is different from business, why it matters, etc. However, to do that, I think we have to link what's been happening in higher education to what's been happening in society generally. So these current issues that I mentioned at the start, issues like levels of student debt, the reduction in, student prote in social protection for students, lack of progress in widening participation, graduate un or underemployment, vice chancellor remuneration, the growing casualisation of the academic labour force, can be readily and are so convincingly associated with high levels of household and public debt, reductions in social security, lower social mobility, inadequate public corporate investment, chief executive salaries that the last count are 120 times the average of their workers, increasing numbers of workers on zero hours or other contracts, and the increasing centralisation of political power. In other words, once again, what has been happening in higher education is a replica of what's happening in society generally and can be very clearly linked to it, really. And I think we have to make that case if others, other people won't. Third and final strand, which is to work with others in, in civil society. A number of writers, starting with Daniel Bell, have pointed out that the familiar state market dichotomy is too crude a way to make sense of modern society. We clearly need to distinguish the market from the corporation, which is a sort of internal market, but we also need to distinguish civil society, and I have a quote there from Colin Crouch, who's written quite a lot about this. And Crouch identifies five kinds of groups that are the quintessential actors in civil society and that are not simply driven by the market values or indeed the state. Political parties, religions, campaigning groups, the voluntary and charitable sector, uh, the professions, and I would include also the trades unions. These all could contest the logic of profit maximisation, um, uh, the hostility of the government to the professions, uh, and Michael Gove's stuff about the blob, and rant, ag rant against experts. All these are classic neoliberalism. They do not like professionals of any kind, uh, unfortunately. But some of these groups could be natural partners with us in opposing the reductive market dogma that currently dominates the public discourse. As the conscience of society, we should really be leading that discussion rather than sort of hanging back, as it were. OK, well, I've almost, I've almost done. Um, let me just summarise what I'm saying and then one add, add one brief postscript to anticipate a question I might soon be asked. Conclusions. One, whilst it's enriched a tiny minority, <coughs> neoliberalism has been a disaster for those countries, particularly Britain and America, where it's been taken furthest by devaluing non-market activities, increasing inequality and weakening social solidarity and support. Secondly, the marketisation of higher education is having a cognate impact on the universities by stratifying and homogenising provision, leading ironically to less choice and poorer value for money 
for both society and for individual students. Three, the universities have a key role to play in exposing the fallacies and inconsistencies on which li neoliberalism is based in resisting the marketising policies that neoliberalism is imposing on higher education and in working with other groups to rebuild civil society and prize it from the grip of the market and its apologists. So that's my kind of summary. I've gone slightly over the 40 minutes that I promised myself. One final kind of postscript. Some of what I've said, um, people, even people who might be sympathetic, say, well, you're tilting at windmills, things will never change, this is the way things will always be. I'm just old enough to remember from the start of what I like to call my career that in the end of the 60s, there were people called the Black Paperites. I won't ask people to hand at all and up their hands who remember the Black Paperites because it might be rather embarrassing for all concerned. But anyway, these was a group of, of very right-wing academic ideologues. Um, uh, Professor Brian Cox and a man called Dyson. And they basically advocated that schools should be run on commercial lines. Uh, they were against leftist teachers, they were against Plowden in the primary schools, etc. And at the time, their ideas were dismissed as total rubbish. No one, no one could give them house room and so on. Now, we have policies for the schools that are even more market-like and consumerist than they ever envisaged. I don't know why people don't understand the system for funding higher education is a voucher system. My Milton Friedman said, don't give the public money to the schools, give it to the parents and let them, let them act as consumers. That's effectively what we've done in higher education, so it's not a surprise that students are acting as consumers. Anyway, I give you the black paper because they said it couldn't be done and it has been done, so there could be a fight back. It would be nice to think that we could do it. Thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, no, absolutely uh, stimulating as ever. I mean, I've known Roger for 25, maybe 30 years, and uh, he wouldn't allow us to share you know, his CV with you. I would actually look at it, and uh, you know, we have the privilege here of someone who has an enormous range of experience, and I think is one of the most articulate and trenchant critics, perhaps, initially of what's been happening in, in education, but also just how much that applies you know, to society more broadly. Now, Roger's you know, very happy to... I suggest we, we run until about 10 past 7, which gives us 10 minutes for, for Q&A if people have questions. And uh, so, anybody want to uh, wave at me initially? Tell me what I've got wrong. <laughs> yeah. Hi, sorry, yes, yes. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> oh, right, behind, sorry. Right. It's far away. Yeah. Hi, thanks for that. It's a broader question. Um, about the question of resistance. Mm -hmm. I think um, the tide is turning and, and the conversation is changing. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting that I thought we have got a, a Gramsci lecture coming up mm -hmm. um, and that whole notion of civil society mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. hegemony yeah. and hegemonic projects is yeah. central to that. Yeah. And yeah. you pointed out at the crucial role of the universities for the yeah. new right in the 70s and stuff. Yeah. So this could be a counter crucial role. Yeah. There, I think. Yeah. Um, <coughs> I think there's a groundswell, you know, at the moment with the you mentioned the trades. So there's a, 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 a appetite out there for a, a rearticulation of, of renationalisation mm. and stuff. Mm. I think the appeal of Corbyn to students wasn't really instrumental. I think there was a bit of heart and soul, hearts and minds going on there. Sure. I think there's a battle for the heart and soul. Uh, of the Labour Party going on at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I just think um, progressive VCs could play, play a much more mm. active and public role. They could publicly engage with governments in Wheaton. Um, they could engage with UCU on uh, progressive campaigns against marketisation, commodification, the introduction of the cash nexus using all of that language mm, uh, mm, which yeah. pushes you know those because that's important I think uh, language is important to um, these sorts of um, civil society strategies and also on campus you could have spaces which are non commodified yeah you could yeah. have um, you know these community uh, cafes which uh, junk food cafes which take 
group that's going to be thrown out and you can engage with the wider community and I think that's yeah. an issue of, of universities. Yeah. Um, so th th there's a leadership role mm. to make for progressive PCs mm. if they exist. Mm. Mm. Okay, should we take one or two more <laughs> questions and I'll, uh, I'll do yeah, we'll summarise from that. And, uh, yeah. okay. So over there and then there, and then we'll actually... Uh, yeah. Thanks, that, that was brilliant, it was really good. Um, I heard um, Higgs, as in Higgs boson, on mm -hmm. the radio about a year ago, and I thought what he said was really powerful because he said he reckoned that if he'd been publishing, if he'd been an academic now, mm. in these conditions, he'd have never discovered the Higgs boson, yeah. basically because of things about the short termism yeah, yeah. and the publish, publish, publish really sort of you know short intervals. Yeah. It completely cuts across anything that takes yeah. a long, I mean, obviously, discovering you know minuscule particles like that is quite a job, really. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I've got chemistry yeah. all over, that's about as far as it goes, but I would imagine it's quite a hard job. And I think there's some stuff about um, trying to make clear some of the, you know, the kind of, sort of, what we have lost and can lose, mm. but mm. also what we could gain if it mm. were different, because I think that's the problem, is that there's often not an alternative vision mm. of what it could be like. I mean, yeah. I, I think you're absolutely right, and I think we really have to say what's wrong, mm. and that isn't said enough, but mm. we have to have some sort of vision of what it might look like, mm. um, particularly, I think, to cut across the crap of like tables and things, because the problem with the problem with part. I mean, I agree with what you're saying, but I think the problem with part of it is the winners are not going to side with us, if you like. Why would they? They're winning. You know what yeah. I mean? Th this works to the advantage, like neoliberalism works to the advantage of the rich. This. What we have now works the advantage of the Russell Group. So the yeah. Russell Group would be mad to, to kind of join, if you yeah. like. Yeah. And I yeah. think we have to have a, a different, not a different vision, not just sort of the sort of like pre apartheid South Africa, separate but equal kind sure. of vision sure. of things, but something that says what really good higher education would look like. Because yeah. I think one of the things that's difficult, I worked in the Russell Group I've, and I've been here um, less than a year. And one of the, the, there's many very good things about working, I have to say, but one of the great things about being here is this possibility of engaging with a, a different sort of student, if you yeah. like. And it's hard, it's hard not to engage with the whole league table crap, not because you buy into it, but because you want the best for your students. Yeah. You want to yeah. say, you lot are brilliant, we do mm. great research here. Mm. You want to have, if you like, you know, the, the best academics coming in. Yeah. The pull is, the pull isn't just because of the crap. Yeah. The pull is because of the pride and you want it to be like. So I think without us having something where we can say, this is what really high quality, uh, uh, research rooted uh, mm -hmm. education mm -hmm. looks like for mm -hmm. large numbers of people. I think, so I think we need the, the positive vision of what it would look like mm -hmm. that people can take a pride mm -hmm. in. Otherwise, you can end up feeling like, well, we're just, you know, we're, either it's, it can be parodies of sour grapes, mm -hmm. you know, or, mm -hmm. you know, what we, it's that kind of vision I think we would need. Okay, thank you. That's really helpful. And the third. <coughs> um, thanks. Thanks very much for that really <coughs> wide ranging and very interesting talk. Um, I'm interested in the rebuilding of civil society, mm -hmm. um, which is hard with, from whatever perspective you're coming from. So, what I'm interested in is your ideas about. What, what does it look like when these partnerships are formed for individual universities? Mm -hmm. And are we talking about local, local partnerships, local collaborations, national, international, or what? And what's the potential for collective action from the university sector in contributing to rebuilding civil society? Mm. From, from my perspective, I see them as absent yeah. from that whole project. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well those are all very, very good points and questions. Um, I'm going to take the first two together in a way because they do, they do relate to one another. Um, uh, first of all, there are, there are certainly signs of a stirring uh, and, 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 a, and a beginning of a change of, of, of view. And you're quite right about rail nationalisation. I travel up from Southampton to London fairly regularly and uh, I was in one particularly overcrowded train recently and um, I said to the guard as she came round, can you tell your bosses that this is ridiculous not to have more carriages and so on. And she said she had tried but God knew where. 
and a guy on the other side, normally, you know, no one talks to anyone in England, you know, on the train, <laughs> uh, unless they're dead or dying, um, <laughs> or stripping off or something, which is very attention-grabbing. Um, and uh, someone else said, yeah, the rationalism. And there was a round of applause, as it were. So I think there are beginning to be signs. But um, you're then on to the point about the second, the second point, really, which is it's not enough to criticise. You need to have some alternative view. Now... I don't know whether you know the book called The Spirit Level. Yeah, there's just a new edition just been published. I haven't read it yet. One of the points that they make, and I've referred to it in my book on inequality, is that actually <coughs> in, a less e in a more equal society, everybody is better off, not just, not just the, the, the poorer, but the richer are better off as well because they don't need to hire security guards and all that sort of stuff. So I think you can make that. But that then leads to the third question, which is, well, who is actually going to do it and how are we going to do it? And I have to say, this is John and I were talking about this earlier, I think the chances of the universities collectively acting in this way are about zero, frankly, for a whole variety of reasons that we don't need to go into this evening. However, I do think on, an, on a more local kind of basis, uh, universities not only could but should actually be working with other local groups in this kind of way. And so the sort of things you were talking about there you know, some of them might be more symbolic, but nevertheless they are things that you can kind of do. And I was also saying to John and John Diamond again earlier that I was very keen on the notion of my university being engaged in the local community, and that's again somewhere where you could begin to build things, as it were. So I think the position isn't kind of hopeless, as it were, um, but there is work to be done. I'll take one more set of questions, um, and I'm sure Roger will stand at the front if you want to have one-to-one -one sort of words as they as they leave. But is there any further questions you know, for Roger? Gentleman here. Hi. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, maybe I'd like uh, to shift you a bit uh, when you look at the liberalism at the higher education, but I also want to look at the school aspect. Mm -hmm. And uh, my question is, uh, what is your take in, it in terms of the practices that are going on in the English school yeah. and what can be done? Well, um, I mean, I said don't get me started on the schools, really. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, I don't think there's anything positive, really, in current policies. Um, I was, I should explain, I'm, uh, I'm quite pleased you haven't given my biography, but I should say that I started my career uh, for six and a half years working for the Old and London Education Authority and one of the jobs I had there was to act as secretary of the William Tyndale School Inquiry, which was all about a school in Islington that collapsed with all hands because of disputes between everybody connected with the school. And so when uh, Jim Callaghan made his famous uh, speech, and then a bit later when the government of the 80s introduced you know, key stages, um, national curriculum, national tests and so on, at the time I don't remember anyone objecting to it. It all seemed very sensible it was a good idea to have so, so people moving that around the country, etc. But of course the effect of all that's been completely overtaken by the balkanisation of the school system, the range of school types, the range of school sponsors and all that, which are ultimately all class-based as it were. Um, so I'm, I'm afraid that almost, that almost all of that is negative. And um, actually if you read the Fiona Miller book, I'm actually even more critical than she is, because I actually think that we shouldn't allow parental choice of school. I think actually pupils should be allocated to schools on, on a banding basis, <coughs> on a geographical basis, and parents should only have a say at the margin, really. Instead of which, of course, we've created this Frankenstein monster of consumer choice. We allow the religious groups to create schools and so on. We're going back, in fact, before the 1870 Education Act, when most schools were run by the British and Foreign Bible Society or the SBCK. So I think, if anything, the situation in the schools is, is about 100,000 times worse than it is in higher education. And the other reason why it's so serious is, of course, this is the system which is the basis for higher education. So if the system is continuing to produce substandard and variable results, which the school system is, let's be quite clear, then it's bad news for higher education as well, which is, again, a reason why higher education should be involved with schools in some way because it's our, you know, it's our sea call, basically. But uh, that's another lecture, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, and I guess that draws us you know, to the end of you know, this evening's as well. Um, we've been running this festival ideas for the last 
four weeks. Um, we were looking for someone you know, to close it, to talk about higher education. Uh, Roger is someone I've known you know, and I have an enormous admiration for you know, his work you know, right through a range, through ILIA, through working for government, through actually heading up you know, public sector agencies as a vice chancellor, <coughs> and perhaps almost most of all, you know, somewhere over the last 10 years, who has written enormous about, about higher education and also about actually the impact of change on society as well. And uh, it's been a real privilege to have Roger with us. I mean, thank you also as well, you know, for being a very yeah, yeah. You know, engaged audience. I mean, thanks to, to John and to Danny, you know, for the organisational work. Uh, but um, my greatest thanks, of course, um, and I think, you know, Roger and I have a, a thousand and one anecdotes of things we've seen over the last 25 years or so. But the greatest thanks of all, actually, is to, you know, Professor Roger Brown. Roger, thanks very much.